Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. All right, it's my pleasure to be here today to, to get a chance to talk to you about uh, human exploration. And I thought I'd do this through some slides and maybe get some feedback from you as we go through the, the, the talk today. I want to talk to you about two things. First of all, why I think uh, humans explore. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about how humans explore. And, I'll, and by the how piece, I'll try to sh explain to you what we're doing at NASA and how we're, we're moving forward with human exploration. So I'll do both of those. And the first one, the why piece, um, you know, I, th I think this is a really uh, amazing uh, group here. I got a chance to go walk around and see the telescopes and see the work and the things you're doing. I think there's probably not another group that probably understands why exploration is important, why curiosity is important than this group that's here. So maybe I can get some feedback from you and, and we can figure out a way we can explain to others that aren't here in this audience or don't have telescopes in their backyard looking at the stars and asking those big questions, why they should be doing those kind of things. I think, first of all, there's clearly some, some tangible benefits. You know, there's reasons that you could, you could try to explain why we're doing things. At NASA, we built a book for the International Space Station. It's called Benefits for Humanity. And, and what we've learned from Space Station is there's lots of things that occur to the human body in microgravity that actually affect, um, can affect us here on the Earth. And, and we call it off the Earth for the Earth. And so, for example, bone loss is a big problem for our astronauts on orbit. If you don't do anything for bone loss, they'll lose roughly 30% uh, of their bone mass per month, which is a tremendous uh, problem. But through exercise and a little bit of medication, we can, we can stop the bone loss. But what's interesting is this phenomenon that occurs in space occurs to all animals. So we're able to fly rodents in space. Drug companies are allowed to fly a, a new drug and give it to the rodents. And if it prevents bone loss, then they know that that's a candidate to go into FDA trials. So it allows them to know very quickly whether a drug has the potential of preventing bone loss in space or not. And that's one example in the biological world. Another area that's of a lot of interest is crews also lose uh, muscle mass, or they lose the uh, the, uh, their, their muscles just become called muscle wasting, like when you're in bed rest for an extended period of time. So pharmaceutical companies can go look at, at that phenomenon. Also, the immune system, for some reason, gets less strong in space than it is on the ground. So again, that's another avenue. So, so the whole idea here is to find these things that microgravity gives you new, unique insight into that you can do on board space station or do in a research facility that will give you some advantage over a researcher that's not doing this, these kind of activities in space. So, so these are some of the tangible benefits. And, and if you think about also all the physical phenomena that are out there, you know, every equation that has that little G in the equation, you can go to space station and that G is removed. So you can look at that physical process without gravity being in there, and it gives you totally new insight into a lot of physical processes. So I think there's a lot of benefits for station, and, and these are some of the tangible or, or more real benefits. Then I think there's also a lot of stuff that's really hard to, to quantify, and, and this is a picture of the International Space Station, uh, ex, or International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Um, it's a group of about 16 countries that get together periodically to talk about what the future is for human exploration. So this isn't the space station program, but this is another group made up of 16 countries around the world that talk about um, what we ought to be doing in space and how we ought to be doing exploration. They put together a global exploration roadmap, which is kind of a framework of, of how we think human presence ought to move into the solar system. And it's a pretty neat document that, that shows that there's general agreement across all these countries. But you know, today there's a, you know, a lot of problems between Russia and the US in terms of the activity that's going on in Ukraine. But the space station is essentially immune from that activity. We've got exemptions from the State Department. We're able to continue to keep working with our Russian partners. They still fly our crews to station. We still operate in space. I still go to Russia almost four times a year, meet with my, my uh, engineer uh, compatriots over there, and we still are very, very active in station. So, so even though we're in a politically tough situation where the governments are not getting along, there's still the engineering side is still moving forward. And, and I don't know how you place a value or a benefit on that, but it gives a way for countries to talk together and find a, you know, a reason for a conversation that's not strained by all the political pressure that's going on in the world. But these are some of the intangible benefits. You know, and then I think you know, also space really forces us to, to answer these big questions. And, and you know, where do we come from? And where are we going? 
and, and are we alone? And I think probably this group, you all share those same kind of things. When you, when you look through your telescopes and you look out and you see phenomena in space, I think it really makes you think these big questions. And, and again, that's hard to put a value on, but I think it's really, really important that we keep that curiosity and keep thinking about these big questions. You know, you take a look at, at what we're doing on Mars and it, it's pretty amazing. You know, we're looking for the, the, the content, origin, and, and evolution of the solar system and also the potential for life elsewhere. You know, is there life on Mars? You know, following the water has been just an amazing activity. And, and this is the Curiosity rover. And, and if you look on there somewhere up in here, there's a, a radiation instrument. And that's there just to get an understanding of what the radiation environment is on Mars. So we flew a radiation instrument with the idea that someday humans may go to Mars and we wanted to know what the radiation environment was. So this device is capturing the radiation environment on Mars every day. And you can see the, as you go through a day-night cycle on Mars and the atmosphere expands during the day, when it gets a little bit warmer, you can see the radiation levels drop. And then at night when it cools off and the atmosphere contracts, there's less shielding. And we'll know exactly what the radiation environment is for our crews moving forward. So a very nice tie between um, robotic science and human science forward, but we're ask, asking those big questions about searching for life elsewhere. You know, I think there's a couple things. Um, I think of exploration and plan, or pioneering, and exploration is expanding our knowledge using virtual and physical presence. So I think we could do a lot today with, uh, with virtual presence where we don't actually have to send humans to those destinations like the rover I just showed you in the, in the previous picture. And I think, think typically you'll see robotic exploration will occur first. It kind of paves the way. We understand what the environment is on Mars before we send humans. Um, we can do a lot of things robotically now that we could not do before. So there's a lot of places where we can, we can use robots where we don't have to send humans. But then I think when the humans come, you know, that also brings a tremendous amount of science along with it. If you look back to Apollo and all the science that was done on the moon, there's still sensors on the moon, I'm sure that you all know about, some retro reflectors that are still being used today to precisely track where the moon is in relationship to the Earth. So a very nice companionship between kind of robotic and human exploration. And I'm focused a little more on the human exploration. I really want to have things where the humans have to go out to the environment. We take the risk of placing the human in the environment and we move forward. So I think just like, like you kind of want to do hands-on things and, and build your own telescope and make your own observations and do things physically, I think that that same thing really drives us in a way. You can do it robotically now. You can do a lot with virtual reality. You can use stereoscopic cameras to get some very nice views, but I don't think it's still the same as, as being there. The other word you're, you're starting to see us use a lot in NASA is this word pioneering. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to, to talk about expanding human presence into the solar system and knowledge, but that absolutely requires a physical presence. So you'll see me and you'll see NASA talk a little bit more about pioneering. It's not that we're going out to really settle in a sense, but pioneering means that we're gonna essentially leave behind components that can be used by other groups. Um, we'll have a sustained activity and there's really not a, a, a finite time scale. It's not like a mission that, that you go complete and then the mission's done and the crews come home. It's more about a sustained physical presence. And I think ultimately what we want to do for both of these is we really need both the robotic, the scientific instrument measurements to be there and also the human presence. They're both absolutely required. You know, and again, I, I believe, you know, we explore and exploration really changes us. You know, this is the, the Apollo 8 image. I used to have this image in my, in my uh, dorm room at college. This really changed the way I think that we, we think of the Earth. And, and I, you know, I wonder today with all the social media and all the pictures we get every day, would this image have had the same effect as it did back in the, in the 60s when we, when we got this image? And, but this really showed that, that there is, we are a fragile planet, we have a very thin atmosphere, and, and I think it really spurred a lot of the environmental uh, movement going forward. It, you can't look at this picture and not think about us being in a closed life support system with a very, very thin, very, very fragile atmosphere. You know, if you take a look at uh, human exploration, um, and there's a very n neat project, this. Uh, geneographic project that's being sponsored by the National Geographic Society where they're, they're tracking how the human species moved around the planet. 
and, what, and they were doing that through DNA. And what they found is the human species dwindled to about 2,000 or so individuals, they believe, at some point during the migration. And what was interesting was they believed that the, the human species lived, and we're all here today, because some folks moved out of Africa and they moved into the northern European regions where it was extremely hospitable to human presence. I mean, it was cold, there was snow, the environment was not conducive. But then a plague essentially wiped out many of the homo sapiens that remained back in Africa. And if it wasn't for the group that had moved into this so-called hostile environment, we probably wouldn't be here today. We might be extinct as a species. So this is a very interesting read if you take a look at this. And so that tells me that there's something innate about us wanting to explore and to push human presence. That's really hard when I run into the, the accountants and the uh, and, and the, the budget folks that, that want to understand, now what are all those tangible benefits? Why are we spending all this money on human spaceflight? And I try to tell them it's about survival of the species and they look at me cross-eyed and then we're, in, we're not in a good place. But, but I think you ought, to, you ought to read this, you ought to think about this, but I think there's something innate, even as a small child or if you look at kids growing up, they really want to immerse themselves in the environment. They really learn by growing and moving out, by crawling, by experiencing, by touching, by feeling by tasting. I mean, the human is bent, meant to go do this exploration, and I believe we're meant to move into the solar system. And, and you can talk to me about this later if you, if you don't agree with me. Or you agree with me. So anyway, so then this is another example, Lewis and Clark, right? It, it, amazing, amazing account of when they went out and they, they did the, you know, the adventure of discovery, where they went across the plains to essentially catalog all the scientific stuff and bring it back. They were supposed to try to find a water route to the west coast. They were unable to do that. I also find it humorous sometimes when I go back and you look at the congressional record. When they came back and they returned with all these samples, they didn't lose anybody during their entire expedition. They came back with all this tremendous information and knowledge. They had a congressional hearing and the Congress told them they were over budget. And so I'm just, so I used to share that story with my space station team when we were having trouble with space station and we were slightly over budgeted sometime in our history. I would say even Lewis and Clark had the same problem and I would read transcripts from their hearing in front of Congress and we're no different than Lewis and Clark. We're still pushing that frontier. If we do, those will question what we're doing and not really realize the benefit of what we're tr trying to do. But again, I make the argument that I think we really need to keep doing these kind of things and keep moving forward and keep looking and keep stretching and, and doing those things that are really, really hard. Again, Apollo, a tremendous accomplishment. This is the Apollo 17 crew. Again, tremendous adventures going out. The geology, the activities of the human being there are just phenomenal. Um, the, you know, if you look at the rovers on Mars, they're doing amazing work, but the amount of research that the humans did through the Apollo time frame is absolutely phenomenal. The, where the, the rovers have, have, have traversed, they'll, they will have gone roughly 10 or so kilometers, and during Apollo, we've, they've tripled or quadrupled that amount of time in, in a very short amount of time. So again, by the human being there, you can really shorten the sample time, shorten the, the data, um, the time for the human to go find things. Uh, Jack Schmidt was a geologist, a trained geologist. He brought back some of the most interesting samples from the moon, and it's because essentially he used his, his skills of, of uh, geology to actually capture samples that were really meaningful. And so having that physical presence there, although it's costly, is really, really important. I'll talk to you now, I'll switch gears a little bit, and I'll talk to you about what we're doing, and, and, and this is kind of the how of NASA. So I'll show you some slides of what we're doing. We're not out of business, as some people say. I think you know that. But when I'm on airplanes, I ask folks, is there anybody in space today? And I generally get, no, that program ended when the shuttle ended, or I get, I feel sorry for you, and it feels terrible. Everybody's booing, that's good. So, but I, I but there's still a whole group that don't really know what we're doing. And then I have to show them that we have six crew on board space station. I explain to them what's going on. If I have my suit on, I show them the crew patch or crew pin that I'm wearing for the crew, that there's six of them on orbit. And if they say there's somebody on orbit, then I ask them their names. They can't answer their names, so then I can show them my pin, and we can actually read the names together. I'll show them pictures, and they, they understand what's going on. But, but what I want to do is give you a chance to, to see what we're doing. And, and this is called our journey to Mars. And, and I really stress this piece, it's a journey. 
So I think sometimes we get too focused on the destination, which is Mars. Mars is clearly where we want to go. Or we get too focused on the time. Now, how long is it going to take us to get there? When do we go? How long will it be? We're not doing this as a mission. We're really doing this as a journey. We're going to do it within the budget we've got today. We're going to make solid advances with each piece ready to move forward into the next phase and to keep building off of what we're doing. And that's what we're doing. And I'll show you in the next couple charts of where we are. I'll show you what hardware's getting put together, what stuff's getting built, and I'll show you the overall plan of, of what we're doing and, and how we're moving forward. So first of all, the, the, the three swirls here are really three mission directorates. One is the science mission directorate, clearly the robotic side, like the rovers you've seen on Mars today. They're gathering science for us today, which is exciting, the radiation environment. The 2020 rover, it will carry with it a device called MOXIE, and its purpose is to remove oxygen out of the CO2-rich environment on Mars to see if we can pull oxygen out and generate oxygen for crews or either for propellant uh, or oxidizer to, to be used in propellant coming off the surface of, of Mars. So we're working very closely with the Science Mission Directorate. This is my directorate, Exploration. And in technology, we obviously need some new technology to do these things. So the point is, it's not one single directorate within the agency. It's really all the directorates working together as a team to accomplish this big goal to go to Mars. And Mars is not easy. And I'll show you some charts about the difficulty of Mars. We also think of this in regions. So where we are today is we're in the Earth Reliant region. And that's on board space station. So we're using space station to understand how the human body adapts to microgravity. To go Mars distances will be roughly a three-year expedition, about a year there, roughly maybe a year on the surface, a year back. So can the human survive for that year in space? And we're using the space station to go ahead and understand how that microgravity affects humans. We also need long duration systems like life support systems that can work for extended periods of time, work for up to three years and still be functional. We're doing that again on board space station. And it's a great place to really learn these things. If something goes wrong and doesn't work out, you can be back home in a couple of hours back to the surface of the Earth. Then the next region is the proving ground region. That's somewhere around the moon, cislunar space. Now your return is a little bit stressed. It's 10, several days to get back from the moon. But again, it's a very good environment to build procedures and processes. Um, it's away from the magnetosphere of the Earth where we're protected from radiation. So you're exposed now to galactic cosmic radiation. You know, you're exposed to more force from the solar particle events that come from the sun. Um, so this is a great place to, it's harder. But it's not such a big stretch that if something goes wrong, you can't really get back. You're still only days away. So this is a great place to test procedures, to test options. I'll show you some slides in the future of what we're trying to do around the moon. But this is essentially the proving ground. We don't see a need right now to land on the surface of the moon. We don't see that that helps us towards this goal. But clearly operating around the moon and using the gravity of the moon has tremendous implications for us as we try to go to Mars. And then lastly, when we're ready to go to Mars, we call this Earth independent. At that time, you're really breaking a tie with the home planet. You've got to carry with you the consumables you need, or you have them pre-positioned or out there in front of you. So when you go, that tie back to the planet isn't there, because now you're months to years away from, from getting back to Earth if something goes wrong. So we see this really as a, as a journey. Like I said up here, we start in the Earth Reliant with Space Station, we move to the Proving Ground, and then we end up Earth Independent. And I'll describe those to you in a couple charts here going forward. I won't read this to you, but this is kind of the, again, another how chart. But this, these are the principles we have for sustaining exploration. And so first of all, I don't think we're going to get a huge big budget increase, and that's what we try to say with the first one. The second one is that exploration enables science, and science enables exploration, which I talked to you about. We don't want to put high or uh, low technology activities right in a mission program. Sometimes that costs us a lot of money. What we want to do is we want to use things that are really ready to be used. So we mature systems off to the side, and we put them into an activity when they're ready to go fly. We need to have some. So I, I talk about maybe not having a specific date to go to Mars, but we need some near-term mission opportunities, some, some pace, something that drives us and forces us to make decisions. So you're going to see us lay out a series of exploration missions, exploration mission one, two, three, four, and five, all in the vicinity of the moon in the Proving Ground region. We'll start defining what those are in significant detail in the next year. You'll start seeing that come out, but that'll create some mission pull or some, some need to make decisions and move forward. We also see us doing a lot with commercial companies. We see a lot, uh, us doing a lot with um, 
uh, with commercial businesses where they can help us. We also see international partners down here. And in this bullet says that every piece of hardware we build from now on as we build the SLS, the heavy lift launch vehicle, it's going to be used throughout this entire period all the way to Earth Reliant. We need that kind of up mass. The Orion capsule will be used throughout this entire period. The asteroid redirect mission, we're going to have a solar electric propulsion bus. That will be the cargo delivery element that will be used uh, for, for Mars class missions. So everything we build in these upfront series of missions, they have some feed forward piece. We made this uh, solar electric propulsion bus refuelable. So when it comes back to the vicinity of the moon, we can refuel it and potentially use this solar electric propulsion bus to maneuver another object later. So we're thinking forward where we try to keep things um, um, built, and we can use them in multiple, multiple applications. So again, this is space station. This is just, a, just an amazing facility on orbit, a tremendous place for us to really learn a lot of these, these things we're going to need to get to, to truly get us as a, as a group ready to be Earth independent. And the other thing that's also cool about this is this also really emphasizes to us how small the atmosphere is if, and really doesn't extend very far into space. Again, a lot's going on in the, in, the, in the space station. It was just at a Soyuz launch a couple weeks ago. The new crew's on orbit. They're, they're busy uh, doing activities. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, we're working extremely well with our Russian partners. Uh, the cooperation between the two countries uh, from an engineering standpoint is absolutely phenomenal. I, uh, they really want to be in space like we do. Or we're very compatible in our goals and objectives moving forward. We're getting started on the U.S. Uh, commercial crew transportation. This is the U.S. capability to take crews to and from station. We've awarded the two contracts, as you know, to, to Boeing and to, to SpaceX. Lots of activity is starting to happen. The first abort test will be done in Florida in May with SpaceX, where they'll do an abort test off the pad with their Dragon capsule. Boeing recently did a water landing down at Langley. And, uh, and they're, they're looking at that. It's a contingency case where they, they put things together. They've got uh, some logistic systems put together for Boeing down at the Cape. Um, they're starting to make some pad changes out at uh, pad 39A. That's the other launch pad where they'll launch from. That's where shuttles used to launch from, from 39A and 39B. We've turned over 39A to SpaceX, and they're making mods to actually make it their launch pad for their human missions. There's already crews starting to, to fly, both in the CST-100 and also in the Dragon. So just tremendous work. And we're, what we're going to do is we'll eventually end our sole dependence upon the Russians. We will still fly Russians on our, on our commercial crew vehicles, and we will still have US astronauts flying on Soyuz. So then we truly back each other up. If there's a problem with each other's spacecraft and they have to stand down, they can't fly for a period, we can still keep flying on the other person's spacecraft. So sometimes you talk about us trying to to end our relationship with the Russians, it doesn't really end our relationships. It just ends our sole reliance on the Russians, which they would like to have some backup capability in case something happens. And when we had the Columbia tragedy, if it wasn't for the Soyuz, we would have had to decrew space station. The Russians were able to essentially help us during that period. We want to have the same capability here with, with crew transportation, so we're not solely dependent <coughs> upon the Soyuz. This is on ISS. Again, I just got to see Scott uh, get get launched to space station. Pretty exciting time. This is a one-year mission. You know, we've done a lot of uh, six-month missions to space station. We've done, not done very many one-year missions. The Russians have done them for one year, but they haven't really captured all the medical data that we're trying to capture with this flight. So this is a great chance for us to really understand, is there anything that happens from a human body standpoint that could cause us concerns if we go beyond the 180 days we've been flying today? We don't think there is, but as you all know, it all looks good when you kind of look at it from analysis, but then when you put your telescope together and you take it out that for that first run, things don't always work as well as they did when they were inside and you, you practiced all those things. So this is what we want to do with the crews. The other thing that happened was we got really really lucky here. We have a set of identical twins, both Scott and Mark. So it turns out that, that we're able to sequence their genomes now, and then we could see how Scott's genome changes compared to Mark's throughout this one year increment. So what's interesting is when, when they were born, their, their genomic makeup was identical, then environment just living their normal lives, and, and both are astronauts, and flying in space and doing things, both of their genomic makeup had changed. So we snapshotted their genomic makeup just prior to launch. Mark has, has agreed to do some medical stuff on the ground. He's agreed to take, um, 
to uh, log what he eats. Uh, he didn't go quite as far as eating freeze-dried food for a full year. He said, he said that was a little inhumane. Uh, and I don't think he agreed to the same exercise protocol as Brother Scott has on orbit, but, but at least they've agreed to kind of track back and forth, and we'll get a chance to see how their genomes change through this increment. It's, it's, what's fascinating to me is there's a whole genomic research community that was, it's, it's absolutely fascinated by this data. For them to get a chance to see if the human genome changes when it's in microgravity versus what it is in 1G is, is unbelievable interesting data for them. So they've agreed to participate in this. So we've attracted a whole bunch of researchers that, I, that had no interest in space, but now all of a sudden they get a chance to see this, this genome change between these two identical twins through a one-year increment in space, and, and they are just thrilled to be part of the team. And, and the investigation will help us also understand and ultimately get us prepared to go to Mars. And these are some pictures that I, I, I grabbed, and, and then after I didn't fully realize that you guys probably have better pictures than these, so I should have, I should have gotten these from, from this crowd instead of me trying to, to, to rummage around and find these pictures. But, but I think these are, these are pretty neat pictures. If you take a look at station, again, backdropped against the moon, this is a, a pretty, pretty cool image. This is another one that, that is also pretty cool. And I got a chance to go look at the sun with some of the telescopes out here today, and it's pretty neat. But to see station fly in front of the sun, and, and this was kind of an experiment we did. Um, one of the, it was essentially an amateur came to us, and they said, hey, if you buy us a camera, uh, we'll take all these images for you. So we bought him a camera, and these are the images he got. And then he gave us back the camera when he was done, and we gave it to our other uh, public affairs folks to use. But, but some just pretty amazing images. And if you look at what you can see with Station, it's there. So I'm sure that you guys could do some of this. So, so you can, here's your challenge to, to match some of these. But, but pretty cool stuff. And, and as you know, this is, you know, the transit of the sun is pretty doggone short. So this is not trivial. of. Uh, of getting these images, but they're but pretty, pretty nice stuff. Oops. Okay, so then now we'll talk a little bit about the systems that we're building for the exploration stuff. So we've kind of talked about the station stuff. Now we'll talk about the the uh, exploration system. So we have the, the big heavy lift launch vehicle, the space launch system. We have Orion capsule, and we have ground systems, and that's what makes up the exploration systems uh, activities. So a lot of things are really happening, and so this is exploration flight test one. I think some of you may have been down to Florida for the launch and got to see this. Pretty amazing event. This is uh, Charlie Bolden and his wife, Jackie, watching the launch and, and, and really excited. And there's the launch over there on the Delta IV. Again, the purpose of this was to go look at the heat shield and understand how the heat shield performs on the Orion capsule. That's one of the heaviest elements of the capsule to see how, uh, if we could reduce any weight or we could change the heat shield design a little bit. We got excellent data. It looks like we'll be able to save a little bit of weight in the heat shield. We also flew all the real avionics for Orion. So all the avionics were real. All the flight control software was real. All, that, all the separation events that occurred during ascent, those were all real. All the parachute events that occurred during landing, those were all real. So we got a tremendous test of the Orion vehicle out of this, uh, this flight test. So um, really, really exciting mission, really, really good stuff. And, and I was also very excited about how much the general public really liked this. I, the feedback after the December flight was just absolutely phenomenal. So I think that spirit of, of exploration, those intangible things I talked about at the very beginning, they're really alive. This country really wants to do this stuff, and this was really a great chance. So we just got to do it faster and keep moving a little bit quicker. And we're moving as fast and as quick as we can. We just did this a couple months ago out in Utah. This is a qualification motor firing. Um, this is the solid rocket motors that will sit on the side of SLS. And this is important because it's a qualification firing. What that means is that this is kind of a run for record. So in this case, uh, we heated the booster up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. It, 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 they put, essentially put a shed over it, kept it warm for four or five days. They got all the propellant temperature up to 95 degrees. They rolled back the shed, and then we fired at the hot temperatures. It worked flawlessly. It looks really good. The data looks excellent. Some people think this is the same booster that we use for shuttle. It's really not the same booster. It has an extra segment, which gives it about 500,000 pounds of more thrust. And then we also changed all the insulation on the inside. We removed about 2,000 pounds of insulation. There's, there's rubber that sits between the steel case and the propellant that burns at three or 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
because of, of asbestos had to be removed, we removed the asbestos, and then we put a new layer in that saved us about 2,000 to 4,000 pounds of weight. And so it's a brand new insulation system on the inside of this booster. So it looks like the same booster. The cases are the same on the outside, but all the inside stuff is different. The grain size is a little bit different. The thrust level is a little bit higher. The thrust profile is different but it's ready to go. This is behind us. We've got one more test we'll have to do with the solid rocket motors where we now do the opposite. Instead of running it hot, we'll run it cold. We'll cool them off to around 35, 40 degrees. And then we'll go ahead and fire at that condition, verify the performance is within specs and it's understandable. And then we'll have the boosters ready to go. So we're ready to go with the SLS boosters and those will be behind us and, and ex exciting to see that moving forward. And then this is some things we're looking at now. We want to get add an expiration upper stage on top of the booster. When we do that, we now have the ability to potentially carry not only the Orion, but also a small, maybe a crew habitation module, a small uh, node with us, and we can lift that. Um, we can also then do maybe like a, like a habitation module, maybe for around the moon. Uh, we could fit that in there without an Orion. We can do science missions. We can cut the time to the outer planets, um, to, to Jupiter and uh, Uranus, by about half. So instead of a seven-year journey, roughly about a three-year journey, which is really important to them. We had the asteroid redirect mission, it could fit in a fairing. And then if we want to go to larger fairing size, eight meters and 10 meters, it's amazing what this rocket can carry. So this, this rocket being 130 metric tons is a pretty phenomenal rocket. Um, again, our goal is to have this thing flying in probably 2018 with Orion on top. We'll do an uncrewed mission around the moon to a distant retrograde orbit, which I'll show you in the chart. And, and that'll allow us to prove and understand what we're trying to do. Then we'll take crew on this vehicle probably in the 21 period, 22 period, and then we'll fly about once a year with crew from then on for a series of flights. Okay, so this is the asteroid redirect mission. We recently have down-selected to where we're gonna to go to a large asteroid and pull a boulder off. Again, as I described to you earlier, the important thing is that this bus that sits out here, is this uh, electric propulsion bus with about 12 metric tons of xenon, 10 metric tons of xenon, that actually moves this or pulls an asteroid off of a bigger asteroid or pulls a boulder off of a bigger asteroid and then transports it by thrusting for a little bit over uh, almost two years of continuous thrusting through the ion system. It actually swings past the Earth, swings past the moon and drops into this distant retrograde orbit around the moon. It's stable there for 100 years with no uh, attitude uh, adjustment, no propellant needed. It stays there, then we'll come up with, a, with an Orion and a crew. We'll go take, pull samples off of this large boulder that we grabbed off, to a, off of an asteroid. But the important thing is it's, it's letting us understand orbital uh, uh, mission design, orbital trajectory design. It's allowing us to uh, use this electric propulsion bus. If we can maneuver this large boulder around, we can move maneuver cargo around for Mars class missions. We can pre-position cargo around Mars before the crews go. And then that's our strategy for going to Mars. So again, the other thing that this mission has showed us is it showed us some advantages of operating in cislunar space or in the proving ground. And if you look at this, you could think of this as kind of a gravity well around the Earth. So this is the Earth's surface. This is the ISS, so gravity's a little bit less. And this is to go out somewhere else. This is a gravity well. And then eventually you get up here and there's a little bit less. And you can see Moon has a very much reduced gravity well. So what we've been looking at is we've been looking at this distant retrograde orbit, which is shown here. And it's, it's outside of the Lagrangian points. This is where the gravity balances between the Earth and the Moon. And this is a stable point, but and you can maneuver around or fly around in that area. But it, you, have to, you have to do attitude adjustments or altitude adjustments about once every two weeks if you're in this kind of orbit. And then over here, same kind of thing. This, this is another, again, the gravity balances between the two, another gravity stable point. But you still need to do maneuvers. Then there's this distant retrograde orbit that sits out here. And, and what's happened, if you think about it, you're kind of, you're trapped between the lunar gravity and the moon gravity. So as you would want to go unstable, the moon pulls you back in. As you start going here and you want it, and the velocity kind of wants to go in that direction, the gravity of the Earth pulls you back. So you're trapped in essentially a, the gravity between both the moon and the Earth. And what's cool about this is it looks like this is a great place to potentially stage missions to Mars from. 
it looks like that this is probably a lower delta velocity or a lower change in velocity required to go to Mars than it would be if you tried to go from anywhere in this region. It's also very intriguing when you come back. So when you come back from Mars, you, instead of trying to enter directly into the Earth's atmosphere with fairly high speeds, 13 kilometers per second or so, you just come swinging past the Earth, you come swinging past the Moon, and now you end up in this distant retrograde orbit, and then the crews would return home from the Moon to the Earth with Orion. So we might not even take Orion with us all the way to Mars. Orion may actually stay in, in lunar orbit, and, and be ready for the crews when they come back home. So we're starting to, to look at those concepts and look at those ideas, but we're trying to figure out ways to, to utilize everything we put here. If we put a, put a crew tended station here, then that could be the safe haven that the crews come to when they come back from Mars. And if you think about it, if you've been traveling for a thousand days and now it's five extra days around the moon before you come home, it's not such a bad deal. And you didn't have to carry the heat shield with you all the way. You don't have to deal with the high entry velocity. You take advantage of the, the gravity of the Earth. You take advantage of gravity of the moon and you end up in a very stable location. So these are the things we're doing. When, when folks say we're not doing anything, we're doing a ton. What we're doing is we're really trying to figure out how to analyze this stuff, how to put things together, how to use SLS, how to use Orion, how we can build this um, solar electric propulsion bus for the asteroid redirect mission. So how all these pieces can get together that, that keep us on this journey to Mars. So we're taking all these pieces, all this planning, all this thought is going in to build this next plan that goes forward. And I stress the word journey. I don't see this as a plan. I don't see this as discrete steps. I don't see it as pathway. I don't see it as stepping stones. I really see it as a journey where we build this capability. We understand all these pieces. We're sustainable over multiple decades and we keep pushing human presence into the solar system through the way I just described to you under previous charts. So that's kind of the how of what we're trying to do. Again, now let's talk a little bit about Mars. And Mars is really hard. I mean, if you look at the transit time, somewhere one to three years, communication delays round trip, 42 minutes. And it depends, again, exactly how far away Mars is. So you make a call to the crew. It takes them 20 minutes, worst case, to hear you. They respond to you. 20 minutes later, you get to hear what they said on the ground. That's a heck of a lot different than space station where it's essentially almost instantaneous communication. So how can we practice on station? We'll put some time delays in. The crews have to be more autonomous. They have to be able to do things without any, anybody from the ground. Um, we need to work on that. Um, again, the, the, the transit time is big. You can see the transit time down here. We can do crew exchanges. We can bring logistics and supplies up. We can bring samples home. You know, if, a, if we have some, some things going on on station in terms of you know, the atmosphere doesn't quite look right. We can pull a sample down from the station and look at it and make sure the water's okay. When you're on the way to Mars, you're on the way to Mars. You are in the Earth independent. You better have all that capability with you that, that you're, you've got to move forward. Um, hardware's gonna have to last for a long time. There's emergency crew return available here. Trash is easily disposed of and it can be burned up in the atmosphere fairly easily. Here you dispose of trash with you and it's just gonna probably stay with you in the same trajectory heading towards Mars and that's not such a good thing. So it's just really, really, really hard when you think about getting everything that needs to be there for Mars and f figuring out all the things. You know, trivial things like, like we carry a medical kit for on board space station. We have a whole variety of pharmaceutical drugs in case a crews get sick or they get a cut or they get something in their eye. We have all these pharmaceutical products. A lot of those don't have shelf lives that will support this. So how do we extend shelf lives of drugs? Food. We carry a lot of freeze-dried food on station, but do we have the right shelf life for the food? Is it tolerable to eat freeze-dried food for th food for three years? Right? I'm not so sure. You know. So do you want to augment that with fresh fruit? And we're starting to do that on station. We're starting to grow lettuce now for the first time on station, which will allow crews to eat. So we're gonna actually now inject some real food along with their other normal freeze-dried stuff. They do get some oranges and, and onions and other things and garlic and things fresh brought up on progress, but, but we'll augment now with stuff grown in space, which is exciting to see. So, so these are the kind of problems we have to go, go do. So when somebody says we're ready to go to Mars tomorrow, I don't think so. We've got a lot of work that we've gotta really do and make sure we are right, because once you start on this journey, you know, this is when you, you better be right and you better have the right stuff with you. The other thing that we've also have done now is we're starting to learn a heck of a lot more about Mars. So this shows you where water is on Mars. And so what's interesting to us is before 
when we did our first design reference missions, I don't think we had any idea that there was really this much water available. And there's going to be a, um, a radar, a subsurface radar measurement device that, that can actually will understand how deep below the surface on Mars water is. And we need to really understand that because I think we'll use water for, for to supplement our, our oxygen that we would have to take with us and also help us with propellant potentially, both oxygen and hydrogen or, or oxygen and methane. Um, but we really now know a heck of a lot more about, about Mars than, than we did before in terms of where, where water is and where water ice is. So this is really a, giving us another degree of freedom of, of how we want to use, uh, use Mars. And you're going to see us come out, uh, I think this year, Jim Green will be here, I think, tomorrow. He'll talk to you a little bit about, we're going to have a, an exercise, we're going to have folks start looking at where you would like to land humans on Mars. So this will be more of a kind of a scientific investigation of which locations would be really ideal from a, from a, from a habitation standpoint so we can start thinking about where we might want to put, put humans on Mars. The other thing that we've got to deal with is entry, descent, and landing into the Martian atmosphere. Today, the rovers, we land roughly a metric ton on the surface of Mars. We now think we have to land roughly 20 metric tons for a human-class mission, and that's an empty ascent vehicle, essentially. So we have to then generate propellant on the surface of Mars to get the crew off of Mars and get them back home to Earth. Um, but, but the point is we've now got to figure out a way to land things that are roughly 20 times bigger than what we've done on Mars, or we've done previously on Mars. So we've got a lot, a lot of work to do there. And again, this is, this is the evidence of it actually changes. So you can see here where there was definitely ice, and definitely 88 days later, there was no ice. So Mars is also a dynamic environment with, 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 with uh, moisture coming and going. This is the, the rover and, and what it's accomplished. Um, you can see how far it's, it's gone. It's heading up, uh, heading essentially up to the, uh, up to the hills and, uh, and up to the face. Uh, again, it's, it's uh, heading to, to Mount Sharp and pretty exciting times, and we're getting radiation monitoring measurements all along the way. This is also interesting to me is that, you know, here's Mars and Earth. So you can, again, just see generically some things are very similar. And this is why I think Mars is clearly our, one of our destinations. Uh, you know, I think when you look at Mars, the water we talked about, the atmosphere that it has, the carbon dioxide atmosphere, the temperature cycles, those things, the basic kind of surface structure here, this is a good place to go for humans. It, it's, it's still inhospitable. You still have to be Earth independent. Some of the perchlorates that are there present in the soil may be a problem to the human, so we're going to have to watch that. But this, this place, Mars, gives us a chance to take advantage of many of the resources that are there. And that's why Mars is kind of that horizon destination. So then we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about human spaceflight and, and, and what happens on, again, for, for Mars kind of things. First of all, there's a distance from Earth up there in the right-hand corner, um, the closed hostile environment, um, you know, the CO2 removal systems. I talked to you about food and water. Isolation and confinement, the behavioral aspects of being in this capsule away from the Earth for an extended period of time are going to be hard. Space radiation, I'll talk to you quite a bit about that. And then I'll talk to you about this altered gravity. But again, space station is a great place for us to learn about all these things on this chart. So we can do demonstrations. So when we're ready to go commit crews to a Mars class journey, they're really ready to go. Again, these are the environmental considerations. These are solar particle events. Um, we have some protection because of the, the magnetosphere from solar particle events. We also shield a little bit in, in the uh, ISS. In free space, there's really no protection for solar particle events. The shielding has to be in your spacecraft. There's some protection from uh, galactic cosmic background radiation or galactic cosmic rays. Um, and again, it's a function of where you are in the magnetosphere. Again, we have none in the... Um, in the uh, free space. We have orbital debris and micrometeoroid around here. Here we only have micrometeoroid. We, don't, we haven't put enough debris out here that we have to worry about pieces of spacecraft hitting us. Uh, we have a lot of sun here. The Earth is a nice, re-radiates a lot of energy back towards our spacecraft, keeps us fairly warm. Out here, there's not as much energy. The sun is reduced and in the isolation and distance. So again, the, the purpose of this chart is really just to stress for you, and I think this audience probably understands better than most how difficult what we're really trying to do really is. This is a 
one of my favorite pictures from station. You can see a lot of videos from the cruise. Um, these are the auroras, and again, this is the solar particle events that we described. So where they, they cause a, a problem to the human body, they sure do create an awful pretty uh, scene in space. It's neat seeing them from above. The crews on space station tell me that, that sometimes the auroras actually extend high enough that they actually feel like the space station is, is traversing through the auroras. So it's a pretty, pretty special event. Uh, the other thing that, that's on this picture is uh, this is Orion, and you know this better than I do. So I use this picture sometimes to say this is probably the only time we'll have Orion at the space station. And that's an inside joke for this audience. And I'll talk to you about the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It's a very interesting instrument. It's, it's looking at high energy particle physics. It's really searching for dark matter. But what's interesting is it's, we've been able to use that to help us with the human side. So this is a really nice tie between where pure science was being done to look at high energy particle physics, to look at search for dark matter, really kind of an astronomical um, activity. But then I'll show you how we're actually using data from this device to help us really get ready to go to Mars. So this is a really nice tie between science and, and the human spaceflight side. So again, this is the, the proton flux that, that exists. This is this period over here, this time frame is essentially the current solar cycle, it's a solar max. Um, and you can see, and this is rigidity, uh, it's a fun function of, uh, you could think of it as energy level, where the, where the higher energy is out here. And then you can see where these little dips occur. Those are when solar particle events occur on the sun. So what happens is, when a solar particle event happens, the heliosphere, or the sun's magnetic uh, envelope expands and it actually protects us in, on space station from that environment of the galactic cosmic background radiation. So that expands and gives us more shielding. We're susceptible to the, the solar particle event, but we actually get shielding from, from the bigger galactic cos cosmic radiation. So what this is telling us is the time we would like to go to Mars is probably at a solar max. So we would like to go when the sun is at its most active, spewing out solar particle events because of galactic cosmic background radiation is less during that time and we can shield from solar particle events but we can't shield from galactic cosmic background radiation. So the cool thing we're starting to learn is there's a strategy here about when we want to go to Mars to keep the radiation environment right and it's not all that intuitive when, when you look at it but by pulling science and pulling data and studying you can really understand some, some pretty new things. The other thing that, that AMS has done for us is, this is our current understanding of, again, this is rigidity, and this is, again, the, the flux level. And these are all the satellites we use today to predict what's happening to our crews on board space station. So we use SOHO, we use GOES, and you can see that the plots and data that's available here. And this was a, uh, this was a solar particle event that, that occurred, and we really had not, we don't have any instruments that could give us this kind of accuracy at these high energy uh, levels. And this, this high energy radiation is really a problem to our crews. We think it does more damage to DNA than, than anything else we have. So we have to really watch these events. And before, the researchers would have to extrapolate where they thought this environment was. They had no knowledge about what was out here. So AMS is now giving us detailed knowledge of this high energy environment. It can actually tell us what ions are there, which protons are there, which heavy ions are there. So we're going to know exactly what the radiation environment is. So even from an instrument that's in the magnetosphere, we're going to understand what the environment is like outside the magnetosphere, thanks to AMS, and we'll be able to test with animal models here on the ground to understand what we have to protect for, or is this a problem, or is this not really a big problem to us as we take humans forward? So just a tremendous neat thing for me to see, a pure science instrument now starting yielding just tremendous results for us from a, from a human spaceflight standpoint. And then I think ultimately, again, now it's kind of switch gears back to the bigger picture. So, so let's now talk a little bit about you know, why we really want to go do this. And, and this was from April 2010. And, and I think this was really captured extremely well from the president. You know, you know we want to learn. We, we, is the capacity for people to work and learn and operate and live safely beyond the Earth for extended periods of time, ultimately in ways that are more sustainable and even indefinite? In fulfilling this task, we will not only extend humanity's reach into space, we will strengthen America's leadership here on Earth. 
pretty amazing words. And, and what's interesting is almost everything you hear from this speech was about us going to an asteroid. Very few people pull out of this speech these words. But these are the words and what we're really trying to do with this journey to Mars activity we're talking about. We are essentially moving human presence into the solar system to actually benefit, benefit us back here on Earth. And, and that's what we're trying to do with human spaceflight. So then this picture, this is a quiz for you. Somewhere on this picture, there's a planet or a star. What is it? Do you know what it is? Earth. Earth. Oh, this is not. This is not a good crowd. <laughs> Man, there it is. And you know, I, I showed this picture in New Mexico, and then, now I showed it to uh, to bankers and venture capitalists and other folks, and they told me this was New Mexico, and that was Mars. So you guys knew that was Earth. So this is. This is, this is a good crowd, so I like you guys. So then I showed him this, and that's it. It's not only that, it's Earth and Moon. And this is what I want to change our definition. And, and I, in a way, when my crews land now in, in Kazakhstan, and they land in the middle of the desert in Kazakhstan, they pronounce their home. And I, and I look at them and I go, no, no, you're not home, you're in Kazakhstan. You're not in Texas, or you're not in wherever you're from in the United States. You're not from Europe. You're in Kazakhstan. No, no, that's home. So, so their time on board space station has changed their perception of home. In other words, now when they, when they come back, just being on the planet is home. So when we start moving out into the solar system and we're on Mars, when we start calling the Earth-Moon system home, then we are where we need to be. So this is the view of home from Mars. So, so think about that. This is another favorite view that I really like. There we are again. There's home from a little bit further out. Again, something <laughs> to think about that I think is pretty doggone special. So again, our job is to, to take those intangible benefits that I described up front. You need to help me translate those intangible benefits into tangible benefits so we can keep doing cool stuff like this in the future. Explain to folks out there that, that don't understand what science and technology is or why you would want to build a telescope or why you want to go look at stars. Or you need to figure out ways to help us describe this to the community out at large so we can keep doing these cool things. I believe we're destined to go do this. I believe we're going to go do it. But I think we as a community need to figure out ways to reach out to normal folks, maybe not us but normal folks and explain to them what kind of cool things we're doing and why we're doing them. So help me figure out ways to do that, and we'll go move human presence into the solar system. Thanks. My first experience with astro imaging was in the 80s with a silver film and it was quite painstaking. My, my, my parents, they, they, 
they bought the, the Celestron 8 and they let me uh, do my, my hobby. Uh, and I was the happiest teenager of the world. I was dreaming uh, in front of the, the brochures with uh, all, all the telescopes. First major discovery was in 2006. On February 24, universal time, 25 local time. Uh, it is during that time when I took an image of Jupiter and I discovered that its uh, white spot oval BA has turned red. This uh, spot is now known as a red spot junior. I had some people <laughs> saying that, oh, why the hell are you wasting your time in the middle of the night just you know, imaging planets? And this is where amateurs fill the gap. And uh, this is how we contribute basically to the development of uh, the science of astronomy. Celestron has always been about imaging. When I got that Celestron 8 back in 1975, one of the things that attracted me to it was it appeared to be built from the ground up to adapt directly to photography. The modern electronic imaging makes it so much easier for anybody to get into this and achieve good results quickly. People saying, oh, I just started imaging in 2008 and they're producing observatory quality work, uh, or I've only been in it for 10 years or whatever. And I'm thinking, my God, I'd already been doing it for almost four decades by the time they even started. So uh, that, that's really been uh, a joy to me that uh, the passion that I've been able to enjoy for five decades, now everybody can get in and do top-notch work right off the bat. You know, the rock case was one of the first cases I used a microscope in. And it became a huge case. And sometimes it's not the actual evidence that's there that leads you down a different road. Sometimes it's what's not there. So it's just it's just things like that that may seem unimportant at the time, but become very important when you're testifying in trial. And I wouldn't be able to confidently testify to things like that without the use of the technology and use of the microscope. Um, they've been great for our curriculum because the students come in with very little knowledge of using microscopes and trying to teach them on a standard microscope is very difficult uh, because you can't see what they're seeing. I think with students today, they've grown up with technology, they expect technology, and then they get in the classroom and there's no technology. So having that technology there, I think, makes it feel more real to them. And I think they're just, everyone's fascinated by microscopic things anyways. With these microscopes and the nice big large pan size of the panel, everybody can see what they're supposed to be looking at. I do love that everybody can be involved and we have six of them and so easily the entire class can be looking at different parts of the same um, insect or the same slide all at the same time. So sharing has just been really a, a plus and they love it they're so involved in what they're doing because the microscope is fun to use I think introducing birding and bird watching to other people is uh, very important to the to the recreational activity um, of birding the spotting scope is great the Celestron Regal uh, spotting scope is it's really versatile and one of my favorite things to do with that is digiscoping uh, and so that it's, it's great, you don't have to carry your, uh, your bulky camera around, you can just, I, I carry my iPhone with me and uh, that's, I do a lot of my photography with that and with the Celestron scope it's just a, it's a clear picture. Very competitive by nature and you know, when I got into imaging I, I wanted to be good at it obviously and uh, just like with golf and anything else really, but it's funny with, just like with golf there's all different types of people uh, that, that do it and trying to fit in you know, my hobby with being a golfer and a dad and a husband, I mean, it, it's tough. So I've learned to process very, very quickly. I've become very efficient at it. And or some guys would spend, you know, a week on one picture. Sometimes I'm cranking one out and, you know, over coffee in the morning. <laughs> Can one filter street lights? Yes, street lights uh, have a few uh, emission lines, uh, primarily sodium and mercury, uh, that can be selectively filtered. What can you see on Mars? On, on Mars, uh, with this telescope, you'll be able to see uh, the polar ice caps. Uh, 
you will also see some uh, dark uh, Maria features on, on the surface of Mars. Celestron has been instrumental in our support of teachers in their quest to bird watch and identify birds and, and engage students in bird watching. They've donated many pairs of binoculars to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Bird Sleuth K-12 program, and we've been able to pass along these binoculars to teachers. Um, kids love tools that they can use to do science. If you put a pair of binoculars around their neck, they become scientists.